So speaking of plants, I think it's maybe a good time we go on a little garden tour. You want to go head out? I would the, love to go on the garden right, tour. Sweet. Well, I think this is the first filmed garden tour that we've done. Mm. I do my own podcast out here in the garden, but mm. this is pretty exciting to be here with you, Mason. Welcome to the herbalist town. This is where community gather, merging the power of people and the flowers, the sweets and the bitter to the salty, the sour. Oh, mommy, it's time for the herbalist town. Welcome back to the Herbalist Hour. Today I'm joined by my good friend, Rosalie De La Fore. She's the author of Alchemy of Herbs and Wild Remedies and a lot of other things. So welcome to the show today. Oh, I'm just so thrilled that you're here <laughs> and that Amanda's here and that we get to hang out. And, and Xavier. And yeah, <laughs> handsome French husband is in the wings too. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And uh, so we're here in the Metau Valley. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this location? Sure. So the Metau Valley is located inland in Washington State a couple miles south of Canada, and it's in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. And very special, beautiful place, original home of the Metau people. And it's uh, still so many undeveloped hills and mountainsides, and we're sitting here in May, and right now the flowers are just exploding, so we have uh, all sorts of native wildflowers going everywhere. and. It's a valley, so one really cool aspect of it is there's the riparian river bed area and the sagebrush step, and then it doesn't take much to go higher and higher up, up all the way up to the alpine. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, all these different ecosystems, there's just a lot of different flora and fauna, and um, it's a very beautiful place to love to be outdoors in. It was honestly one of the most beautiful drives I've ever been on. So it yeah, it I, actually like technically is actually it's like the the loop is like one of the most beautiful drives. Oh in the really? United States, yeah. That's the yeah consensus. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, so you, you're talking about blooming flowers. Yeah, we saw a lot out in your uh, property, uh, but you also have a lot of house plants. How many house plants do you have? Um, not enough. Okay. <laughs> oh, that uh, is the official answer. That's then. the official oh, okay. answer. Yeah, my Thought husband has a specific. different view on this. Yeah. Um, so different opinions, but clearly not enough. Okay. Um, I don't even know. I haven't counted them recently. I bet that there's 200 house plants. Oh my gosh. I was going to say 30. 30. Oh my gosh. Know. In this room, there's 30. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I put them in every single room. And then right now I have all my garden starts ready too. So that's probably another 150 plants. So technically in the house right now, I, we could be approaching 400. Would you say you identify as a plant person? <laughs> <laughs> They're okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, we'll stay on that track. Uh, do you remember a first plant that you remember having a relationship with as a kid? Mm, I do have this memory um, of living in, I lived in St. George, Utah at the time. And my dad and I went on, it was probably like, I mean, I'm pretty young here, so I'm maybe eight. Mm. And we went on some kind of like naturalist trip in a snow canyon area. And the guide for the trip pointed out Mormon tea, mm. uh, which is a relationship to ephedra, and uh, sometimes called Brigham Young tea. And it's just this like very you know simple looking plant. I don't know. Do you know? Brigham I, Young tea? I, yeah, I've seen pictures of it. I can't say I've ever seen a person. I want to say when I first started working at Mountain Reserves, they sold. I don't know if it was Mormon tea, but I'm pretty sure it was ephedra. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah. So, so I have some. It's an interesting looking plant, and yeah. I remember you know. The guy telling us like, oh, yeah. you can break off a bit and chew it and how that it was used as a tea. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually have a horrible memory. I don't remember a lot of my childhood, mm -hmm. but I remember that. And I remember it was wow. like mind blown. Yeah. And I thought it was the coolest thing. I did break off a bit and chew it. It didn't taste good, yeah. you know, but I like, even as a kid was like, this is the coolest thing. Mm -hmm. And I remember I would, when I ever I, like was with that plants with friends, I'd be all like, oh, well, let me tell you <laughs> about wow. this plant. So yeah, I so remember that. So you're kind of herbalist early on. On. Well, that was the kind of an isolated right, incident, sure. yeah. honestly, like that <laughs> didn't, I remember other seedly. things like we went to, um, see a super bloom in, um, oh, it's escaping the famous desert in Nevada, um, death Valley. Oh, okay. And we went and saw super bloom. And I remember buying a coloring book there and like, I just loved that coloring book and I love the flowers. Mm. And so I remember like little things like that, um, later, like in my teenage years, I was really interested in natural health, mm -hmm. like in ways that like most teenagers are not. Like I remember going to the library and getting a book like on um, vitamins for dummies. Like, you know, those yellow mm, books. Totally, yeah. yeah, so yeah. I got that and then I like made flashcards. So I'd remember like what vitamin A is like for in the body and stuff. Mm. And 
Um, I was actually just telling you that I would, when I got my driver's license, I was super excited to go to the health food store like by myself. <laughs> and so I was very interested in natural health from a very young age. But it really wasn't until later that that kind of like that general idea of like natural health merged into actual plants. Mm, okay. Yeah, I could see like the thread looking back how yeah, like, that's you're how making, it is. You're making yeah. flashcards and stuff. It totally seems like a Rosalie thing. And, yeah. Um, so, so how did that kind of transition you into your study of herbalism, like properly? Mm -hmm. Um, well, so I, there was like, again, a couple of threads in mm, sure. college. I was, I like to say I minored in activism and mm. I worked on a lot of like indigenous rights versus a uh, big oil campaigns mm -hmm. and, um, and you know, I was pretty like righteous and angry, mm -hmm. you know, that, like, I had this idea, like, oh, if people just knew that their clothes came from the sweatshop, they wouldn't buy them anymore. Right. And so I would stand outside a Gap and hand out, like, flyers about, you know, the the horrible things yeah. that were going on. And yeah. I would, you know, did a lot of, like, you know, it was in Portland, Oregon, did yeah. a lot of, like, street actions and civil disobedience and all that kind of stuff. And um, anyway, I got kind of disheartened because apparently yelling at people is not a super <laughs> great way to, like, convince them that, like... They might want to change their ways. And like mm. nobody going into Gap wanted my unsolicited flyer. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of grew like disillusioned yeah. with that, which I always like to say that, you know, direct actions and civil disobedience ha definitely have a time and place. It was just like for that time in my life and the way I was doing it, it was just kind of burnt out and it became cynical and, and that sort of thing. And then um, I, like long story short, found myself at a wilderness school and like kind of a... Uh, they call it primitive living skills with earth-centered living skills. And so we're doing things like going out into the forest and learning how to find and purify water and build shelter and foods and uh, all that kind of stuff. So I did that and was an apprentice at that school for a couple of years. And one of the teachers, Karen Sherwood, ethnobotanist, plant person, and I was just became really drawn to that. And we did... It was very, it was all field study. So it wasn't learning about plants and books. Right. It was out in the field. We were harvesting, tending, making food, making medicine, making baskets, making tools. And I was just, it was like the whole, a whole new world had opened up to me. Like I really look at that as like, there was like before Rosalie and after Rosalie. And that was a huge shifting point in my life that I just began to see the whole world entirely differently. Is that where you met Xavier too? Uh, kind, yeah. yeah. Like I studied there for a couple of years and he was studying at another school for okay. a couple of years, but he, I ended up being admin for that school and he came mm. to study at that school and we ended up carpooling just by like. And you were like, ooh la la. Oh, immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tell him, I fell in love with him at first sight. Um, he was wearing wool, which like in the, that world, it's like wool is really cool. And like Gore-Tex, not cool. <laughs> so he was wearing wool and I was like, that guy knows. And he was French. Right. And I had, I had been obsessed with France, like pretty much, you know, my whole, like since I was 14, really. Totally. So I was kind of like, oh. He's a tracker. He's French. I was like, thank you. Yeah, I, I want to get kind of back to the history of Rosalie and how you got into herbalism and all that. I'm kind of curious yeah. what your fascination with France is. And do you think there's kind of an overlap to that in like, say, natural living? Or mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, for me personally, I know we've talked about this before, my, my favorite city or one of them is New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And there's a strong French uh, undertone there. But um, I'm just curious, like, how does that infuse into your daily life? And what is your fascination with France mm -hmm. overall? Um, well, I started taking French when I was a teenager, mm -hmm. I think because my dad wanted me to take Spanish. Um, <laughs> so you know uh, how it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So I started taking... I'll take French. <laughs> yeah, I'll take French. I now speak both languages, mm. um, but definitely started with the French. And yeah. uh, I went to France on a school trip when I was like 16. And I, I remember just arriving there and feeling like, oh, I'm home. Yeah. Oh, this is actually bringing it back to the plants. Mm -hmm. So I'm there, I'm 16, I'm on this trip. And it was like a 10-day whirlwind school trip, you know, where we doo -doo -doo and go to all these places. Sure. But I just felt like... I'm home. This place yeah. was so cool on so many different levels. And I did not want to come home. Not like, oh man, it sucks. I'm going home now. Yeah. Like I was like 100%, like I did not. And I just, towards the end of the trip, I was like seriously thinking like, how can I figure this out? Mm -hmm. And I had this plan. Everybody would walk on the plane. I'd be the last one. And I just turn around at the last moment <laughs> and like walk back. Yeah. And in our tour guide had told us that in France, France has a flower rating system for each 
town. And so you can be like a four Whoa. flower town or a five flower town. Mm. So I was like, they need people to plant flowers. Mm. So I'll just get a job. I'll be like immigrant labor planting. I was like, I was dead serious. Wow. Like I was just like, and when I got home, the only time I've ever been really depressed in my entire life was like two months after that trip. I you're just, just missing it. Missing it. Yeah. yeah. For whatever reason. Is that flower scale on a scale, like say one to 10? I can't remember what the oh, flower scale is. That's, yeah. that's cool that they even yeah. have that. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. So going back to your herbal stuff, uh, who would you say were some of your early herbal mentors? Um, well, so, you know, I learned like ethnobotany and mm -hmm. field stuff and you know, botany itself with Karen. Yeah. And while I was studying at that school, I came down with a really weird set of symptoms, mm -hmm. which is a, you know, look at another long story short, sure. but I ended up having, um, being diagnosed. Like I was totally like bedridden and, mm -hmm. um, could barely make it to the bathroom on my, by myself and stuff. Yeah. And, um, I ended up being diagnosed with a very rare autoimmune disease and, I was at a, in Seattle at the time, and I had a whole team of specialists working to, first to diagnose me. And then once they got the diagnosis, um, they this is how it went. They said, you have a rare autoimmune disease. There is no cure. We can mm. give you high-dose steroids, which will work temporarily, but not in the long term. Wow. And you will have a slowly declining quality of life, and your life expectancy will be around 40. And here they gave me a brochure. Yeah, they, they, and they, they were just like, we don't know anything really about this disease because it's so rare. Yeah. And they gave me a brochure and they gave me like a Yahoo group, you know, like those old Yahoo group sure, kind of things. Yeah. And they were like, you can find That's some cool. information here. Wow. And that was that, which um, I would honestly, like there was two days there that that was really intense for me. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole like, why me? And, you know, just disbelief and all that kind of stuff. But because Western medicine had just like shut the door. I was like, it took about two days for me to be like, okay, what else is out there for Sounds me? Sounds like survival. Like, I'm yeah, gonna like what else? Something. And at yeah. this point, like I'd always been interested in natural health, but it was like a hobby. Sure. It was like, oh, you have a bruise. What can you put on there? You know, mm -hmm. like really kind of like boo-boo things or whatever, you know? So, um, yeah, so I dove into that world. I didn't have very much money at all. And so I started going to student clinics, like that Bastyr there mm -hmm. and stuff. So I went to all these like free clinics and stuff, trying to like gather information. And what was so interesting to me is everybody I went to, I'd be like, I have Stills disease, yeah. dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and they were just like, meh, like, <laughs> who are you? Right. What is your life? Yeah. You know, this kind of stuff. And sure. at first it was frustrating. I was like, did you not hear me? Right. I have a rare autoimmune disease that's going to kill me. Right. Um, and, but then, you know, but really no one reacted to that. It really was like, and so it was this whole like paradigm shift for mm. me too. And so I did six months of working with people. Um, I was a very healthy vegetarian at the time, which means I ate like gluten and soy right. <laughs> and some like veggies on the side. Yep. And so I had to like clean that up a bit mm. and have a more nutrient dense diet. Mm -hmm. And um, I think vitamin D deficiency was huge. But anyway, so, and then I, so I saw a Chinese herbalist mm. and I drank the most horrible <laughs> potions I've ever drank in my life. Yep. I do it over the sink because sometimes it didn't stay <laughs> down. Yeah, yeah, it was not good. <laughs> but after six months, I was symptom free. Wow. And that was a huge paradigm shift because Western medicine is supposed to know the shit, right? Yeah. And they did not have answers for me. Mm. And I went back to my doctor you know, it's like, I'm 23, right? Mm -hmm. I know everything in the world there is to know about everything as like 23 year olds can do. Yeah. And I went back to the doctor because I thought she'd really want to know, <laughs> like, <laughs> by the way, I cured just my like autoimmune disease. <laughs> yeah, I totally thought. <laughs> and she just looked at me and she said, there's just no scientific evidence that um, the what you eat would affect your immune system wow. in that way. And I was just like, but look at me. And she yeah. said, maybe you're misdiagnosed, which is just kind of absurd because right. I had all the symptoms and I was in the hospital and yeah. everything, you know, it's just, yeah. So, so that like at that moment of like getting better mm -hmm. and then just thinking about how all these people, whether they have a rare autoimmune disease or not, just made me think like, there's a lot of people who've been told like, this is it for you. This yeah. is the end of the ro road and who might not see natural health, holistic health, as an option. And I was like, I'm going to help those people find this route. And because I was in love with the plants, yeah. that was that like natural. So with Karen, I learned a lot of like wild food harvesting, um, tools and stuff. And then after that, it's like when I became, you know, more interested specifically in herbalism and medicine through plants. 
Yeah, I feel like that kind of catapulted you into wanting to share this with the rest of the world, and now you do such an amazing job with it. Um, would you almost say that this might be your like mission in life to to help people fall in love with the plants and have them help them with their health? Yes and no. Yeah. Um, mm. In that, I would say like early on, that was very yeah. much like that was the thing. You know, mm. just like holistic health, helping people find answers when, especially when they've been told like yeah. all we can do is manage your disease and that sort of thing. But there was this other thing that happened to me with the Wilderness Awareness School that I was talking about, like sure. that before Rosalie, after Rosalie. Mm -hmm. And I went from like pretty much being raised in small cities, but cities nonetheless my whole life. Um, when I first started studying plants, it was that like wall of green. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, I didn't know plants at all. Like on my first herb class day, I learned what plantain was. Mm. <laughs> and I thought that was really cool. <laughs> I remember that. Um, so I really didn't know the plants and that like process of learning the plants. Yeah and the ecosystems and all of the interactions of the many beings there. And then the role that I and other humans can potentially play in terms mm. of tending that and forming those connections. That was ultimately like the biggest thing for me. Yeah. And I became a little disillusioned in my own clinical practice because like long story short, and I you know went to eight years of school and yeah. had a clinical practice and I loved being a clinician, but at that time, I wasn't able to like bridge that gap. Like I felt like I was recommending turmeric to people right. and they were getting great results, yeah. but it wasn't like that deeper thing, you mm -hmm. know, that deep connection to the earth, which ultimately, you know, yelling at people in the front of the gap doesn't do anything, but connecting yeah. people back mm. to place yeah. is a powerful transformation. And I think what we desperately need, mm. um, and it's a joyful thing you know it's not like a yelling angry thing it's a joyful thing um and do, you know, now i have the privilege of watching my students go through that transformation and you know brings tears to my eyes every yeah. time and just yeah. like watching people's lives and views expand and you know have that deep sense of connection yeah. sometimes it's strengthening a connection they already had sometimes it's like sparking something totally new it's just that so that's kind of like that's my mission now yeah. and i think that herbs are such a wonderful there's so many entryways into connection to land but herbs are such a wonderful way because when we rely on them for medicine mm -hmm. that is a powerful connection yeah. um you know it's like when i walk outside and i go visit the elderberry the elderberries in the fall and know like this is the medicine that keeps me well in the winter mm. and that's a profound interactive experience not just to like that's pretty yeah well you and i both do a lot of say online herbal education i think there's definitely a place for that and i probably go on the soapbox almost every single episode now but i do think it's incredibly important for folks to get out there and probably learn from an in-person teacher say at an event or a local mm -hmm. apprenticeship that kind of thing and and build on your foundation that way uh, so yeah, I had the same experience at the Columbine School. There was that wall of green, and then you start learning individual species, and then you go out in the woods, and you feel like you have a relationship uh, with these plants, and then over the seasons, you see them over and over again through their cycles, and then it just becomes like this magical experience, mm -hmm. so. Yes, absolutely, that's, that's it. Yeah, so. I have a hard time explaining it. Yeah, you know, I think you like, did a beautiful job just there. I, yeah. well, I just feel it can be so profound, yeah. so magical, yeah. so wonder-filled, and yeah. so just like, like the what life is about yeah. you know like deep love yeah. really and so it, it is hard to explain <laughs> it but when people tap into it and feel it that that's all that we need you know especially coming out of like say the slumber of the winter which we are right now um getting back out there you're like oh yeah this is right this is what like real life can be like i forgot about this <laughs> so especially you know being behind the computer screen so much but so after wilderness school what uh, what was like say your first herbal apprenticeship that you took um, my first official one was East West School of Herbology oh, okay. nice. in California. Mm -hmm. I did their four year program. Yeah. And then I also studied extensively with Paul mm -hmm. Bergner. Shout out Paul. Um, I did a, like a lot of long distance with Paul and then, um, spent some time with him in the rainforest mm -hmm. in Oregon, actually. Um, the major influence on me. I had his, um, you know, all of his CD sets and yeah. <laughs> stuff and I would just like, I mean, I've listened to all of those five Hang times, probably. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so then I did um, a mentorship with Carter Perdix in Calsa mm -hmm. uh, for years, yeah. but I also did a lot of study with him in person in class. And I cool. would drive from where I live now to Seattle, which is a four hour drive. So I'd listen to Paul the whole way there, <laughs> go, you know, to two or three full days of class yeah. with KP and drive home listening to Paul. So wow. 
I do have an obsessive personality. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, I, I, I don't know if you consider Jim McDonald per se a, uh, a teacher of yours, but I'm sure he's been a huge influence on, on some of your herbalism. Uh, would you say that's true? Huge influence. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. so I don't want to speak for you, but um, he did supply a question for the interview today, so I'm going to play that for you now. Okay, knowing yeah. Jim, I'm a little worried. Yeah, yeah. In a good it's way. It's pretty vulgar. <laughs> no. Hi, Rosalie. Hi, Jim. So, question. Vampires. Do you think if you treated their blood deficiency that they wouldn't need to bite people anymore? Or do you think if you or me or another person were to use blood building tonics like beets or Romania, um, if they bit us, they wouldn't need as much blood? I'm just interested in your thoughts. Bye. The way that Jim's mind works, I can just see him laying in bed at night thinking, like, he probably really considers this. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, I mentioned I have an obsessive personality. Mm -hmm. So when I was, like, 14, I was really obsessed with vampires. This is, oh. like, before it was cool. And does he know this inside? I don't know oh, okay. that he knows <laughs> But I was, like, mm. yeah, legit. Yeah, everything in my life was vampires. Actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, my, um, my sophomore. Amanda likes the Twilight series. Yeah. Right? <laughs> 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 Yeah, this was like before all of that. You okay, know? oh, okay. Um, yeah. My sophomore <laughs> English teacher refused any more um, books about vampires. Like she wouldn't take any more book reports oh, wow. if it was a vampire. <laughs> but she put her foot down. And then she gave me Outlander, which mm. has plants as medicine. Mm. Not a great source of information, but plants as medicine in Outlander. Garlic. <laughs> <laughs> so Jim's yeah. question. Yeah. I, it's an interesting idea that blood building for vampires <laughs> I wonder if that would treat the underlying condition, but maybe in exchange they might miss out on eternal life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, so that could be, maybe some people, you know, some vampires would be ready for that. Cause sure. That is a common thing within vampire stuff is after a couple of thousand years, there becomes a little bit of like discontent. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that they're plant people though, because yeah. I think I could use a couple thousand years right, right. spending time with the plants, <laughs> totally. you know, all over the world and everything. So maybe that's the ultimate cure for vampire boredom is. So you're saying vampires plants. start to get bored of being alive. So yeah. they're ready to go. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, all right, Jim, there, you heard it. All right. All right. <laughs> I was concerned about the second part of the yeah. question though, because Jim's saying yeah. if we take blood builders, Will vampires need less blood from us? I'm just kind of curious yeah. what's going on for Jim in his life right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Jim, leave a comment in the YouTube video to this interview with your thoughts. We'd love to. We'd love to know what you think. So, <laughs> awesome. Well, um, sweet. I, I'm. I've always wanted to hear the story of uh, you going to the Northwest Herb Fair and meeting John Gallagher mm. and kind of how that evolved and like kind of. Uh, transition to your next phase of your herbalist life. Um, that's funny that you reference that. I actually yeah. met John previously at another fair. Oh. I met him the same day I met Xavier, my handsome friend. Oh, husband. I don't know if I knew that. Okay. Yeah, so we met at a Derek Jensen event. Derek Jensen is an author. Okay. He wrote uh, many books, including Language Older Than Words. Mm -hmm. So we were at an event where he was speaking, and it was like an Earth Day event. And I was tabling for that school that mm -hmm. I was working for, and Xavier came up to me and started talking and I recognized the accent and I said, where are you from? And he said, France. And I said, oh, je parle français. And he says, I don't speak French with Americans. <laughs> so anyway, love at first sight, like I was saying. Um, and yeah. that same day I met John Gallagher and he came up to the table too, cause he knew Karen. Um, mm. And you know, he's like, just said hi. He was just being very extroverted and just said hi. And yeah because I'd never met him before. And I knew of him because he worked on the Kamana training program and was a big mm. thing at Wilderness Awareness School. So I was like meeting a star, you know, yeah. like, oh, Sean Gallagher just introduced himself he to me. He was a star you know? all those years ago too. Yeah, oh, yeah. wow. So, um, <laughs> so I met him there yeah. and just, you know, that kind of brief interaction. Mm -hmm. And then, we, yeah, we were at the Northwest Herbal Fair in the summertime and we had booths again next to each other. Mm. And then a propane tank exploded. Like big explosion, oh, big wow. loud noise, yeah. you know, kind of like everyone running oh kind of situation. Gosh. And so we found ourselves like together, like wow. kind of watching the flames and everything oh my gosh. from a distance. Right. And we just started chatting and he said that he was, him and his wife Kimberly were renting out their basement and uh, I was in Seattle at the time and ready to leave mm. Seattle in the big city and they were renting their basement for half the price of what I was paying for. Mm. And I said, sure, I'll take it. Yeah. Just like that. And their kids were very young then. Haley wow. was like 15 months old and she's in college now. So 
and then a while ago. Were you working on, on projects with them at that point or? Um, no, oh. uh, but I started to almost oh. immediately. Wow. So back then, you know, he had, he had the blog and everything mm -hmm. and he asked if I wanted to do a recipe article for the blog. And so I made mm -hmm. rose hip syrup. And wow. I had like this old digital camera yeah. you know, <laughs> and I took pictures with that and, you know, did the whole like step-by-step -step thing. Sure. And with John, it just like kind of grew over time. Like he kept asking like, do you want to do this? And yeah, do you want to do this? Yeah. yeah. And it just kept growing from there. That's super cool. Did you uh, both publish the book together, Alchemy of Herbs, if I'm remembering correctly? Was that a project between the two of you or? Um, yeah, like he did, like, so I wrote the book Okay. and he did a lot of the like marketing and okay. we both worked on the design a lot together. Okay. Yeah, right on. Yeah. yeah, well, so John also supplied a question. It was John, long time listener, first time <laughs> caller. And I was wondering what would happen if I took all of the plants that you see here in this garden and tinctured them at the same time. Is that a good idea? <laughs> Another that is that an inside there. joke too? <laughs> no, okay. just his face was so funny and just a long pause. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I never like to tell people what they are doing is wrong. Yeah, because <laughs> what do I know? Yeah, you know? sure. Yeah. Um, you know what I like to do with that kind of thing? Granted, like the, you know, all the plants are like safe and everything yeah. is to make a, like a bath tea out of them. Mm. You know, it's like a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there to do that with like wild plants or your garden plants. Mm. Then you can kind of like literally steep yourself yeah. in plants, which I love. Totally. Um, so I might recommend that for John. All right. Yeah. Good, that's a good suggestion. Um, and then there is a type of tincture that you could make that's like, is capturing that, you know, like mm -hmm. maybe you want to go out on summer solstice or a special day to you or something and harvest a whole bunch of plants. And again, knowing that they're all safe, et cetera, but harvest those and then tincture them all together. I wouldn't use that as like a, um, I mean, I never do this anyway, but I wouldn't be like, oh, you have X problem. Like yeah. here's the tincture for that. Mm -hmm. But I would use it as like a, like if, let's say you did that on summer solstice, mm. that can be a wonder, like a wonderful winter remedy. I'm just like, it's capturing that mm. whole essence of yeah. what that day was and the more intention you put into it, the better. And, um, and then you can rely on that. So it's more of like, say a, a spiritual type yeah. of practice as With, opposed to when you're certainly getting yeah. like, yeah. you know, like chemical constituents and sure. all that kind of yeah. stuff, but it is bridging those yeah. together. Presuming they're all edible or yeah. usable yeah, yeah in that regard yeah, yeah you don't throw like monk's hood in there or something right um but yeah i've, I've heard of people doing that as well with say like a, a flower essence and that kind of thing so yeah. uh yeah you get the, the the medicine of that place that's a good suggestion yeah. all right well there you go john good idea rosalie um so speaking of plants i think it's maybe a good time we go on a little garden tour you want to go head out i would the, love the to yard? go on the garden right, tour sweet well i think this is the first filmed garden tour yeah that we've done. Mm. I do my own podcast out here in the garden, but mm. this is pretty exciting to be here with you, Mason. It's, it's I feel like I here. need to give like a, we are at the very beginning of the gardening season. Yeah. So we had snow on the ground weeks ago, Crazy. like not like many weeks ago, but like a couple weeks ago. Sure. So, and it was just a very long cold spring and now everything is bursting forth. Um, but the garden is very much in its like infancy stage and just all the plants are little, little. <laughs> um, but luckily Mason and Amanda have agreed to make the short trip back from Wisconsin to here in the summertime <laughs> when you can properly see the garden. So I'm very excited for that. And we have it on record. Don't 100% edit. happening. Don't edit that out. Not. <laughs> <laughs> what? You said. Oh, my bad. We're going to yeah. listen to Tori. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm really excited yeah. to be here in this particular spot because I just noticed this spot yesterday and like these, I mean, they just come out of nowhere, mm. right? Like the violets popped up and then with the daffodils and you can see how this fresh contrast. it is. Like this is leaves wow. right here that yeah, they're poking through. Look at that. Cool. Poking that little flower bud. Popping right through. through. Yeah. So very exciting to be in this like very beautiful little, mm. at the base of a cherry tree um, with flying ants. <laughs> um, yeah. So... I love violet so much, and I actually planted all of this violet from sprouts mm. from uh, Strictly Medicinals and from a friend who had some violet odorata, and I've just been plugging it everywhere, and it's starting to become kind of weedy and go everywhere, which is what I want. Yeah. <laughs> I want it to be everywhere mm. um, because I love violet so much. 
I actually only fell in love with Violet like not too long ago. Hmm. Like, I don't know, it was maybe five years ago, but um, I hadn't spent much time with Violet Odorata. Hmm. Have you? Not really. I, it always makes me happy when I see it pop yeah. up in the spring. I mean, the but, smell. Yeah. You should grab one and smell because right. that smell is just like. The flower is the thing that has the odor. The, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's such an incredible smell. And the thing, you can't capture that smell. No. Like, that's not something that has ever been able to be captured, which is so special. Wow. It's so special that we can capture a lavender smell, right? Mm -hmm. And I cherish that. Yeah. And it's also so special we can't, this is it. Right. This ephemeral spring being, we yeah. get to smell this smell um, and then, you know, enjoy it for such a short time. Right. And it really is a, um, a beautiful reminder of just to be present yeah. and to enjoy the spring. And right about now, things are like ramping up really quick in the garden. There's always just so much to do and it's easy to be like, dun, 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 you know, yeah. but this is like, oh, let's take some time to be with the violets. Keeps Tori present. Amos uh, actually says to kiss the violets as they're waking up, which I think is a beautiful, you know, <laughs> metaphor for like taking the time to spend time in spring. And mm. um, yeah, so they, for me, like the violet medicine first and foremost, it's just what violets do for my heart in the springtime. Mm -hmm. The gladdening, the yes. happiness, like, oh my gosh. And they did just come up so fast. Making medicine and food with violets is so much fun because mm. the aesthetics are right. just gorgeous. Yeah. So I love to make violet syrup, which does, you know, impart that flavor that's so special. And when you make the violet syrup, depending on your water and what type of water you have, it might be blue when you first make it or pinkish. And then you can add uh, drops of lemon juice and it changes it um, until you get the, what I like is like the deep purple. Mm. And it's just so cool. <laughs> this deep purple syrup made from these flowers. And you're saying it does impart some of the, what we're smelling. Yeah, it, it tastes does. somewhat like that. Oh yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then with that syrup, you could just have that syrup. I'll talk about medicinal virtues in just a moment, but you could just like have that syrup by the spoonful. But what we like to do is we make violet gelato. Oh, wow. Okay. Which is really fun. Um, or we make violets. I make a kiss the violets. <laughs> Tori <laughs> reference cocktail or mocktail. Mm -hmm. And so that's really fun. Then, of course, you can use the flowers to adorn salads and cakes and all sorts of things like that as well so there's just there's like really endless possibilities to how to enjoy violets so even that like the medicine even if it had no medicinal virtues just making the syrup and then enjoying that also medicine because yeah. it's just such a again a theory a, a, a ephemeral plant, that's the word, <laughs> ephemeral <laughs> plant that, um, that you really have to harvest yourself. And sometimes um, Chinese medicine apothecaries will carry the leaves and stuff, but mm. often not super great quality. So really this is a plant that you need to get to know, to harvest yourself. Um, in many places it does grow weedy. Mm -hmm. Definitely look for that smell. There's lots of different violets out there, but when it comes to this type of medicine, I love the odor autumn. Um, there's a lot of wild violets out there and I don't recommend harvesting wild violets unless you are very connected to place mm. and you know the status of, you know, some violets are kind of, um, less hard, you know, less populous yeah. and you could come across like one patch that's like big and beautiful, but that might be the only patch for many miles. And right. so it's not just a plant that you want to find like one good stand, but you really want to be in touch with like, what is the status of this plant in this region? Um, is it at risk, et cetera? So it's nice to have these like weedy varieties in our lawns and mm -hmm. stuff where we can enjoy them and harvest them um, and not have to worry about having any kind of negative impact mm -hmm. um, in that regard. Yeah, so medicinal gifts of violet is, you know, energetically they're so cooling and soothing and that is like a great indication for their medicine. So like whenever you have hot, dry conditions, violet's there to help you. That can be a hot, dry cough, um, hot, dry skin. Um, yeah, just any type of heat and dryness in that sense. Uh, Jim McDonald, who we mentioned, um, and he talks about violet being so great for like rigidity mm. and anger. Um, and how there's a softening to Violet, like, you know, just a softening in our personalities even as well. Uh, really, Violet can really modulate inflammation, especially inflammation due to dryness. So uh, used pretty famously for things like the dry eczema, dry skin conditions as well. Are you referring to the aerial parts tinctured or tea mm. or both? 
Um, so I love to work with the violet flowers mm -hmm. and the violet leaves are fantastic as well. And they persist much longer. Okay, and so yeah. these are also like, if you give them a little nibble on the leaves, they have a demulcent quality to mm. them as well as the, mm, I can just immediately feel that. Oh yeah. And a lot of violets Slimy. are very similar, but some of them are more, um, especially the roots can have other constituents that can be like nausea inducing. Mm. So really good to know like what your native sure. species is and, and again, harvest with care. But yeah, the slimy on that. Yep. But you know, on a hot summer's day, like adding some violet leaves to a salad. Mm. Um, yeah. I don't like it as the only salad green, right. but a little <laughs> bit of salad green is good. It makes a really great nourishing infusion. Okay. violets but again it's like you kind of have to harvest it yourself and dry it you can dry the flowers kind of sort of like technically you can but they like this one is not kind of spent uh -huh. and like when they actually fully dry they just become like these like curled up little tiny pieces mm. of themselves so better to make medicine with these fresh um so i love the syrup i love the tea people do work with it as a tincture I, i'm not really a tincture person mm. um so especially for something that's cooling and moistening right. you can get some of those properties into a tincture but alcohol is so drying mm -hmm. and warming that it's you know if like you really want the cool soothing medicine of violet then a tea or a syrup is going to be mm -hmm. better um, also i love to infuse this into oil with dandelion mm -hmm. as like a lymphatic massage oil mm -hmm. as well so it does make a lovely oil in that regard did i mention we make a gelato out of it <laughs> <laughs> is it blue uh yeah oh wow and you could add like it makes a, you know, like bluish, but you mm. could add something like butterfly pea flower. Oh, okay. Make you know, it just really to like, make a pop. Yeah, really make yeah. a pop. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, very impressed with how slimy the leaves were. I know I've had it. It's been a long time since I have violet leaf. I'm a huge uh, marshmallow root infusion fan. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to try uh, harvesting and drying some someday and trying the infusion out of the leaves. I, I suspect it'll be quite slimy, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's an, I think it's a, such a wonderful thing. Um, maybe we could talk about lawns in a little bit but sure. i'm all about not having a monoculture grass mm -hmm. lawn and it's yeah. a great thing to get established in your lawn it can be a little tricky like i've had trouble getting it in our lawn just because like if you already have like thick matted grass then it can be a little bit more difficult but with a little bit of urging you can get it um spreading and um you can i know you all can't see here but you know there's probably like 15 different violet flowers which um are spreading mm -hmm. exuberantly and i hope they continue to spread because you just really can't have enough violets around yeah this has been uh the, smelling that again it is reminiscent you know how like the the memories associated with smell and everything i'm like oh yeah for sure i remember this one you know, smell a vision, but <laughs> yeah, I don't even yeah. know how to ex explain that yeah. smell. It's, it's like kind of sweet floral. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. Yeah. Oh, people make um like jams and jellies out of mm. violet stuff. Yeah. Oh, vinegar. Mm. Uh, violet vinegar is quite nice, and you can make that into like a shrub or ask. a yeah. drink mm -hmm. or um yeah. Our our book Emily and Mine's book Wild Remedies. We have lots of violet recipes in there. Um, some of those Emily created, like the cocktails and mocktails and stuff, they're quite inventive. Mm. Um, so those are in there. And yeah, love violets. And I'm just, you know, I know you'll be back for yeah. the summer <laughs> visit right. when everything's blooming, but this is like a special <laughs> thing to have time with these violets since they're here for such a short period of time. Yay. They're also super nutritious. They're like filled with all sorts of lovely things, especially like rutin and just wonderful heart health mm. too. Like these are great, like nourishing for the heart. Herb. One of my favorite things about the herbal community is we just love the common weedy everyday plants. And I feel like this one, even though it is that, I feel like it's still underappreciated perhaps, but um, I definitely want to start utilizing this more, spending more time with the, the violet now. Mm -hmm. Mason said I had to talk about dandelion. I'm just kidding. Well, it's true. <laughs> you would like casually drop that like three times. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like quick to pick up the hint. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to hear what you have to say about one of my favorite plants. I know. I yeah. love that this is one of your favorite plants because yeah. it's one of my favorite plants on so many different levels. Dandelions. Um, you know what I don't get, Mason? Hmm. So one of my very favorite times of year is when the lawn bursts into dandelion flower. We're kind of right on the precipice of this hmm. right now. And like as far as the eye can see, we can kind of see it from our view here, like past the camera and stuff. There's just dandelions everywhere. It's like these little nuggets of gold, uh -huh. like that fill the lawn. Yeah. 
and there's bees and beetles and spiders and ladybugs and all of these different beings so thrilled that the dandelion is here and it's so beautiful and people literally poison the earth and their own water tables in order to prevent this beauty from happening. Yeah. Like, that's kind of fucked up. Yeah, it's fucked up. It really yeah. is. <laughs> like, it just, like, I know we all know that, yeah. but, like, if I start to think about it even a little bit, I'm just like, I don't get it. I really don't get it. Can I share a quick story with you? Please, we do. Were, we were just staying in an RV park. I won't say where or anything like that, but um, this person was using Roundup, uh, spraying weeds on their tiny little, you know, gravelly, proper area essentially and uh it just seems so bizarre to me i'm like they're temporarily staying there and they decided to pull out roundup and start spraying these dandelions and they're not they, they don't even live there you know what i mean it was the that most bizarre, bizarre experience i debated like talking to them or something like i was deeply offended by it it was yeah anyways i just wanted to share that <laughs> yeah well yeah. i think there's something to be said for saying something yeah. um like, you know, as I've learned, yelling at people doesn't work. <laughs> I definitely have that, like, that yeah. I know. Um, but, you know, talking to people on a personal level, yeah. maybe even not strangers, even, like, our neighbors, yeah. to express, like, sometimes, like, they aren't ready to love Dandelion the right. way that we are yet. Right. We'll get there. Um, but it's well known yeah. that Roundup causes problems. It's banned in Europe. Yeah. Um, and to talk about things, you know, like a sibling or a friend or, you know, a family member who's gotten mm. cancer. And, um, you know, it's like literally you're not supposed to use this around like children and animals. And, you know, even to talk about that, like some people really love their dogs or yeah. whatever, you know, and to talk about like, let's make this place safe yeah. for us all. Sometimes that, especially if we talk about like shared values and not like, I'm going to tell you you know right. everything you need to know and like finger wagging again i know this because i have done this like sure. ad nauseum yeah. <laughs> um, but but i do think that it's not hard like once people have that like because i think that a lot of it's autopilot mm -hmm. like they just think that they're supposed to spray roundup or right. whatever you know it's autopilot once we interrupt that i don't think it's that hard to love dandelions because again like this is so beautiful yeah absolutely beautiful and then of course the dandelion has so many gifts mm. that it offers us which we could be here two hours talking about <laughs> dandelion gifts um i definitely think that these flowers they bring joy to the heart you know just by looking at them but also working with them is quite joyful um i used to make a lot of dandelion flower mead mm. and one year i got my husband involved in the uh, harvesting of it of which he was not entirely thrilled uh, because it takes <laughs> tedious, a lot sure. yeah it's kind of tedious and it yeah. takes a lot of work um but you know he helped me and after a while like we just started like laughing and having a great time and i really do feel like that's just like the magic of dandelion like <laughs> it just starts to infuse you know that like pollen gets over your fingers mm. and it just is a really happy experience and it does make really great mead and makes great jelly makes great fritters, makes great petals to sprinkle on uh, salad, really high in lutein, which is wonderful for the eyes. Mm. <laughs> and um, yeah, just wonderful nutrients as well as bringing the joy. There's a lot of dandelion lookalikes and one way to know for sure, one of many ways, which we'll go over, is that dandelions, there's one flower for one stalk. So some dandelion lookalikes have like multiple flowers coming off the stalk. One flower, one stalk, and it's a hollow stalk. And sometimes it exudes a milk sap on mm. it. There it goes. Sometimes, all the time. Um, so that could be another way. With the dandelion flower, there's the yellow petals, aster family with Dan, um, ray and disc flowers. Then underneath it are these like bracts, which can be kind of um, bitter. And so I use my thumbnail to just kind of separate those two. Mm. So there's the that bottom the top you can also separate the green parts here sometimes i do sometimes i don't one trick in working with dandelion flowers is that you have to wait for the sun to come out because they they bloom with the sun and they will cl close kind of later on in the day but you have to harvest them and use them if you harvest them and put them in a bag and put them in your fridge mm. they just become puff balls or they close up so it's really like now is the time <laughs> like i have the time to use them i'm going to use them right now is how you want to do that um I would say, though, probably the flowers are some of... I don't use the flowers as much as other 
wonderful plant parts like the leaves. This is a wonderful toothed um, leaf. Dandelion comes in a lot of shape and, and sizes and sometimes people think that they can identify dandelion by the leaves. That's not a great indication um, for people if you're just starting out because there's still a lot of leaves that look like dandelion. This has a lovely tooth appearance. Another thing about identifying dandelions, it has a smooth vein on the backside. If there's prickles there, if it's fuzzy there, then that's not dandelion, something really smooth. Mm. Um, I love the leaves. In French, we call the leaves pisson lit, which sounds so beautiful. Uh, it means piss in the bed, which you will do. Um, hopefully not in the bed, but it's definitely a diuretic with the leaves. And um, one time I experienced that in a way I'll never forget it. I made dandelion pesto, which is one of mm. my favorite ways to enjoy the plant as well as to convert others to enjoying the plant. So um, both of those are true. And so I made dandelion pesto and I was at a friend's house and I was sleeping in a loft with a ladder. It was kind of like a <laughs> rickety ladder, you know? And so um, it was like my fifth time down that ladder in one <laughs> night. And I was like, oh, it was a dandelion, <laughs> what was I thinking? So it does work really well for that. Um, and then just super nutritious. And I love that these, you know, some of our first spring greens, they have so much calcium, phosphorus, manganese, potassium, it's like pretty much all of those, it's in there. Um, and a wonderful way to enjoy the plant. And this early spring, when these are young leaves like this, they're pretty good. They might have a like slight bitter taste to them, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like a good, like, rawr, like totally. kind of bites back a little <laughs> bit. When they become like, like, yeah, like a lion, <laughs> thank you. When they become super old and like leathery feeling, sometimes that bitter taste is more challenging. So, and not really like something that my body is like, oh, please give me more of that in the way the spring greens are. You know, my new favorite thing to do, which I hope I have time today to mm. do for you and Amanda, yeah. is make dandelion greens hummus. Oh, wow. Which is essentially adding dandelion greens to a hummus recipe. Oh. It makes it green mm -hmm. and then just kind of gives it, you know, this different dandelion flavor. Sure. You decorate it with the flowers yeah. and pansies and, flat and violets, all these spring things. Um, I hope I really have time to yeah. make that now. <laughs> we can pick the leaves for you if you want. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, wonderful food, wonderful medicine. And then there are the roots deep below the earth. Of, this long taproot that reaches into the earth and pulls up all sorts of nutrients. And that can also be wonderful medicine for the liver. And my favorite thing, like many people though, is to chop it up and roast it mm -hmm. and make it into a dandelion beverage. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely medicine. I, we drink that all the time, mm -hmm. just as like dandelion love, you yeah. know, liver support and all of those nutrients. You can eat the... Uh, root too. Uh, it's sweeter in the fall and sometimes people say like in the fall it's better for food and in spring it's used up the inulin which I should talk about. Mm. It's used up the inulin and it has less sweetness to it and is more bitter and so that might be a better time for medicine. Um, inulin is really high in the leaves and in the roots and people get pretty excited about taking expensive probiotics <laughs> for like healthy gut flora mm. um, but really continuing it's kind of like emerging research but it's really showing that what makes a bigger impact on your gut flora is eating fiber and eating things like inulin which is a prebiotic and so leaves and roots have inulin in them so great none way. of the leaves had the inulin yeah, as well that's yeah. good to know so yeah wonderful way to support healthy gut bacteria too hmm. yeah what did i leave out i don't know i really liked how you went from basically the flower stem leaf to the root. I thought that was really nice. Um, you also were able to flex your botany skills. I liked how you talked about the, the various parts. Um, oh, I, I forgot to mention that yes. the basil rosette uh -huh. is with the leaves. Because again, like some plants will have like a stem and then multiple leaves off the stem, but all of these come from a central point in the ground. So that's another identifying peach. Oh, and look, now I see what I didn't talk about is dandelion buds. Oh yeah. I love the buds. You can just harvest these like this and again, take off those like bottom parts that can be kind of bitter. And you can just add these to salads and that sort of thing and just eat the dandelion bud. 
I also like to ferment them with radishes. Mm. It's just like a lacto ferment or a sauerkraut fer ferment. Um, and that's pretty good too. Our mutual friend Aaron one time showed me a recipe. I don't remember, it's been years now, but it was uh, some sort of pickled dandelion buds and there was like tamari and ginger and honey mm, in there and stuff like that. Yeah, it yeah. was actually really good. I wanna do that this year if we can, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, but we really could spend a long time and there's just so many benefits to dandelion. And yeah, I guess my uh, personal story is it was the, I always call it my gateway herb, and I know it probably is a lot of people's gateway herb, but uh, I remember it was growing in our my front lawn when I was in college, and uh, someone told me that you would eat the leaves, and it just kind of blew my mind, and mm -hmm. I was uh, super stoked about that, and ever since then, it's kind of become my symbol of getting into herbalism and stuff like that so uh but yeah before that i was just reflecting when you were talking about the blowing the seeds and stuff like that um i remember as a kid i would purposely blow the uh seeds around to try to spread them mm -hmm. And it's just funny looking back now. I'm like, oh, that, that kind of makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> You're already tending this plant. Kind of yeah. was, yeah, in a way, without knowing it. So, yeah. Yeah, I like to say that, like, if, um, you know, that dandelion brings joy with the flowers. Mm -hmm. And if that's not enough for you, then you can just blow the seeds and make <laughs> wishes. Like, a plant that gives free wishes is right. a plant that we can love all the time. That's right. Um, but I think that there is a powerful action to be had for, like, the simple thing of helping our neighbors to love dandelion mm. too because it's something like i don't want to get this wrong but i want to say it's like 80 billion tons of roundup gets sprayed wow. by homeowners or renters and um people at rv parks yeah. <laughs> you know so it's like that's a huge impact that goes into our waterways yeah. it affects our birds our insects and um and our well-being as well so mm. i think there's like a tremendous impact mm. You know, at one point we thought, you know, spraying DDT was a good idea. Yeah, right. And now we know it's not. Mm. And, um, you know, it took silent spring and a lot of other people's yeah. work around that. And I feel like there's a really a lot of potential for a grassroots movement. Mm. And again, not to yell at people um, and make them feel wrong, even though it's very tempting even yeah. for me. But <laughs> that kind of bringing people in yeah. and having that shared values of wanting to live a happy, healthy life yeah. and wanting the same for our children and our animals and... Um, so I think there's a really strong action around that, which not only our neighbors, but like in Seattle, there's pesticide free parks, mm. you know, and it can be a matter of like talking to businesses and parks mm. and, you know, on that town level too. Yeah. And a lot of places get sprayed again, like, look at how beautiful this is. Yeah. Ooh, one of my favorite things last year, um, so last year, the you know, there was the dandelions, they were in flower. There's not one seed head right now because yeah. we're really at the beginning stages. Right. Um, but then, you know, then there's the seed heads. And last year, um, for a long time, I watched the um, sparrows and pine siskins come down and eat the dandelion seeds. Wow. Yeah, which was really sweet. I actually learned that from Cascade mm. Anderson Geller. I didn't know you could, that we could really eat the seeds. Um, but she taught me that and then watching the birds. You just kind of come along into all these little flowers or seed heads, dandelion seed heads, and just eat them. And um, are you saying humans are able to eat the seed yeah, heads too? Yeah, yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, huh. they take a lot that. of work. Like you could sure. just like take the heads off, like pew, and just kind of chomp on the seeds yeah. like that. Um, but you could also like harvest a bunch of the seeds and put them in a paper bag, and mm -hmm. like the fluff will like come off, and then you can kind of winnow it um, wow. down. It's, you know, they are high in protein, but a little. They're pretty small. Yeah. So right, it's right, like, right. I don't know, you know, it's kind of something to do like for fun. Yeah. I want to do it just for the know? energetic aspect. Yeah. yeah I want to give yeah. it a shot. Yeah. So much joy in the dandelion. Right. Yeah. And certainly uh, that there's just such a powerful symbol coming up through sidewalk cracks and yeah. just reminding us that even cement isn't forever and the right. plants are going to overcome and, mm. yeah, and bringing us joy and sidewalk cracks too. Yeah, man. Well, I thought since we talked about dandelions and lawns mm. that I would share this experiment that we're doing, which is the Yarrow lawn. So where I live, it's super dry and there's not a lot of water. And when we bought this place, it's this huge lawn and um, we're trying to use less and less water. And but I like like soft ground to walk on to, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like figuring out what to do about that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of like they're rewilding your lawn is kind of like something that's grown in popularity. Yeah. But a lot of those rewilding lawn stuff, like I see a lot of it come out of the UK and it's like they're using very like 
plants that really still need water. Like I've seen like clovers and self heels and violets and mm. et cetera. That just doesn't work here mm. as a lawn that needs very little water. So we're doing a yarrow lawn. And this has been a big project that especially my husband has been working on. I should not take full credit. Um, so he took this big piece of this big section of the lawn and first he dug up all the sod and all the grass and then he seeded in pounds and pounds of yarrow. Wow. And then he had to meticulously water it um, for a very long time. Like it took a while to germinate and get started. And this year was kind of the year of like, is it gonna work? And it is coming in really beautifully. And so the idea is that we'll have this like soft lawn that we can walk on and enjoy. Uh, that has other, you know, we have plenty of dandelions growing okay. in here. We do have some clover, we have mullein. Um, so there's lots going on there, um, but then we'll have the yarrow and we'll keep it mowed. Uh, mm. So we aren't gonna have like a meadow. Right. Um, Cause this is like a very, this is a space that we use a lot in terms of like having picnics yeah. and that sort of thing. So we want the lawn, so we'll keep it mowed, but it's just so beautiful. I don't know if you can come down with me, but a um, little patch of it here. Um, and now I get to boast that, I mean, how many yarrow plants do you think are here? 20,000? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so quite the yarrow, but it's kind of like an ongoing experiment and I haven't really shared it much with folks because we're just waiting to see if it's going to work. But if it does work really well and it gets established and ideally takes very little water, then we're going to implement that in other parts of the lawn as well. So the way you came about this was uh, the whole rewilding the lawn situation. You're like, all of these other plants, are they, they desire a lot of water, whereas yarrow <laughs> doesn't. Uh, did you all think of this? Uh, was this one of your ideas to do the yarrow? It did lawn? come into my mind yeah. as an idea. Um, wow. But then I like looked into it to be like, yeah. you know. Has anyone else done yeah, this? Uh, yeah, yeah, lawn, yeah, yeah. So we found more information about that. And um, yeah, and we still, there's like mallow growing. So there's still like different plants in here. Um, but we're hoping the yarrow will be the, the biggest one because it really does, it really, it thrives here. And yarrow is a very popular or common plant yeah. around here. And um, so yeah, so really hoping for that. Right here. Yeah. Yeah, just looking at it, if you didn't tell me it was a yarrow lawn, I would just think it was a regular lawn. Yeah. It's very cool. When you look really, like right now, all those like little tiny baby yarrow, mm -hmm. if you look at them close, they're pretty cute. Those little baby <laughs> yarrow cute. leaves and everything. Yeah. They're just so beautiful. What a neat idea. Yeah. It's a very herbalist thing to do. Yeah, and then I can talk about yarrow. Sure. Yeah. Maybe when we get back inside. That sounds good. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks for that tour, Rosalie. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. All right, we're back. We weren't just sitting here the whole time. Um, okay, so we were talking earlier pre-interview about, say, marketing and herbalists. And I was just curious if you could kind of share with us some common pitfalls that you see, say, that herbalists do in their marketing mm -hmm. efforts, or if you'd rather go on the tip route, do you have any just kind of general tips for marketing for herbalists? Because you're, you're very good at it. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing is that so many herbalists shy away from marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be for a couple reasons. Like, one, because... To many people, just the idea of marketing is like sleazy. Mm -hmm. um, or it can be like even just like a fear of like, what does that mean to like promote plants, which is something that so many of us hold sacred. Yep. Um, so there's that, of just kind of like fear against sleaziness. There's also just people, a lot of people just have like money hurdles, sure. you know, like that can just be difficult for them. And I'm not even placing a judgment on that, just sure. for better or for worse, it can be a hard thing. Um, it can be a hard thing to like put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a hard thing to like, I don't, like I recently advertised a marketing course mm -hmm. and I did have some blowback of yep. people um, feeling like, oh, you're an herbalist when you're of service, yep. but making a living is less important. Right. And I agree that mm -hmm. being an herbalist is to be of service. Um, that's how I live my life. Yeah. And I think it's important that we put food on the table and that we have a place, you know, a safe place to live. Yeah. And, um, and I want, if somebody wants to be an herbalist in some capacity as a means to like how they, uh, support their family and themselves, I want them to be able to do that. You know, mm -hmm. like I don't want anyone to be like stuck in a cubicle or whatever job that they hate yeah. when they really want to be working with plants. Yeah. And so I think it's important that we just acknowledge that. And in order to 
success, oftentimes like we don't have jobs as their bliss. Like we have to be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And so we have to take the steps to like be successful mm -hmm. at that. Um, so there's that issue. The other thing is, so if you look at the herbal industry as it is today, it has grown exponentially in the past couple of decades and it's a billion dollar industry, yeah. you know, billions of dollars, yeah. which the thing about that is like, grassroots herbalists, like if you were thinking like, here's a pie chart of like mm. the eight, you know, whatever billions of dollars, grassroots herbalists are like not even, you know, it's like the tiniest yeah. little line, right? Sliver and of the pie. Sliver of the pie. Yeah. And that is worrisome to me because a lot of times the big portion of the pie are these major corporations who yeah. are not concerned about sustainability, yeah. ethics, or even the art of herbalism. It's like they've commodified herbs. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. People think that like, oh, if I am a marketer and I make money as herbs, I'm just going to commodify everything and like take away the special essence. But I'm like, no, we don't yeah. do that as yeah. grassroots herbalists. So we can yeah. be... Um, infuse our love and our connection to the earth and our ethics and responsibilities into everything we do. Yeah. Um, and I think I want to see us have a bigger piece of that pie because when somebody becomes newly interested to herbs, I want them to find the grassroots herbalist, yeah. right? Because right. like I was saying earlier, um, you know, as a clinician at a point I got kind of like, you know, disenchanted because I was recommending like, you know, here, here's some turmeric capsules and take that and all oh, they got better. But we're <laughs> missing out on systems thinking mm -hmm. and whole system health and truly like the beauty and wonder of herbalism, which is that connection. Mm -hmm. And so people might get started with herbs because they go to Walmart and they want to try, um, you know, marshmallow root for their heartburn or something like that might be how they get started yeah. because that's so easy. But I hope that's not how they end up. <laughs> you right. know, like I hope that grassroots herbalists can really bring them. So I want us to take up more space um, and become a part of that conversation so that herbalism isn't totally co-opted into this like commodified business, but is more of a transformative experience for everybody involved. Yeah. I love the way you frame that. Just picturing the pie in my head. I'm like, of course we want the grassroots, the, 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 those types of herbalists be taking up a, a bigger piece of the pie. Cause mm -hmm you know, why not? And we were just interviewing um, Sean Croak in Olympia, Washington, and I think his tincture company used to be called Understory Apothecary. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, I'd be, I would feel good putting my money towards that. I don't feel like I'm contributing to say like this big capitalistic, uh, capitalistic society when I'm giving him my money, you mm -hmm. know, I'm just helping support him and his family and that kind of thing. So yeah, I love, I love the reframing of it. it. I almost wonder if some people are listening, they're almost making it sound like we're making excuses for uh, making money and, and, um, and, um, you know, uh, contributing to the capitalist society in this way, but really it's like, yeah, we gotta, we gotta have shelter. We gotta put food on mm -hmm. the table and all this other stuff. And I, I couldn't agree more. I really think that learning the basics of marketing and business and putting yourself out there so you could reach more people is just a, a good smart thing and potentially even, uh, good for the earth in a way, but I'm like, but I, I'm, I'm like a slow incremental steps kind of guy, you know, like, I don't think we're going to fix the world overnight, yeah. but I do think that if we keep increasing that sliver of the pie uh, and giving our money to the herbalist, the smaller scale herbalist, that that is a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, I, other, I think yeah. there was a second part. I don't even know if I answered your first question at all, but you didn't. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, I think you did. But yeah. another, so another yeah, sure. part of that is like sometimes the marketing that we're aware of is, mm. you know, can be like, it can be sleazy, yes. right? I think of like the used car sales right, person right. or Touché, like, yeah. you know, mattress sales right. or whatever, <laughs> right. like that feels, right. you know, ugh. Yeah. Um, what's wonderful about marketing today for the like small entrepreneur yeah. is what it really is, is learning who you are, mm -hmm. who your business yeah. is, and then how to authentically share that with yeah. people who want the services and gifts that you're offering. Yeah. And as herbalists, I think like we get bitten by the herbal bug. Right. We get so excited. Yeah. We take in all this knowledge and information yeah. and then we can easily feel like, like internalize that yeah. and then think like, oh, now everyone's just going to come to me because I'm doing cool shit. Yeah. But, right. you know, and then, yeah. and then we think like, oh, if we say like, oh, I'm an herbalist or I sell herbal products yeah. or I'm an herbal teacher, yeah. that that in fully conveys what we do because we know what that means. Yeah. You know, like if I, you know, tell you I'm an herbal teacher. Right. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. you know what that means. Sure. Um, but obviously, like our ideal audience, mm -hmm. the people we want to attract, 
you know, who are not yet herbalists and mm-hmm. don't know what that means, they don't know. So mm-hmm. it's really just like bridging that gap. Yeah. It's not about like manipulating people or forcing people or, you know, all of that kind of thing. It's just saying, here's who I am. Here's my gifts. Or again, it might be your company's gifts or whatever. Um, and here's what I have to offer in such a way that the person who's like wanting that in their life can identify and be like, oh, that's what I want. Yeah. And, you know, then engage with that. 100%. Yeah, I feel like Herb Rally is started as an extension of basically my interest, which was promoting herbalism and a natural lifestyle. And I do genuinely for whatever reason, enjoy like the marketing and business aspect of it for whatever reason. Uh, and then when Amanda joined Herb Rally too, now I feel like it's kind of an extension of her creativity and stuff like that. So I, I love how you frame that as far as like your business can be just uh, basically a reflection of your personality being put out there. And that's essentially what you're doing when you're marketing. You're, you're just promoting yourself um, maybe uh, maybe in a, um, a more systematized way, I guess, but, uh, do you have any intentional, way. intentional, that's yeah. a good word for it. Yeah. Uh, any like quick tips on what you would recommend for people do, I, I was going to think maybe like email marketing or something like that, mm-hmm. collecting email addresses or do you have any tips for the mm-hmm. audience or, um, I, so for me, the first step is learning how to copyright mm, that nice. is before you do yeah. anything else. Yeah. Like people often ask me like, you know, what should I post on Facebook or should yeah. I get an Instagram account or yeah. all of these things? And like those things are like step five and six. Yeah. And oftentimes when people get frustrated with those mediums, which there's a lot of reasons to be frustrated with those mediums, I'm not even saying everyone should do social sure. media by any means, but oftentimes that frustration comes like because they skip to that because that's like the visible part of marketing, mm-hmm. but there's like all these other invisible parts of the process. Yeah. And that is really comes down to copywriting. And there's books on it and articles and whole courses. I've taken five. Um, (laughs) It's not something that I was like blessed with naturally. It's something I've worked hard at. And I think I've gone from like being like pretty bad to like, I'm okay now. So you're you're good. And uh, actually we were talking. I really think that though, like I'm okay now. Like, I mean, there's people, copywriters who are just like so brilliant, you know, like that stuff. John Gallagher is quite good at it, I'd say. Um, I wanted to say, you said something yesterday about you invested in your education surrounding this. Um, Basically, what Rosalie was saying was uh, it's a good idea to um, invest in certain classes around this type of stuff because it'll mm-hmm. pay off dividends. Would you say that? Or Yes. Yeah, so uh, I think I started my first blog in 2008. Yeah. And back then, online schools and, you know, product services, that was just kind of like infancy level, mm-hmm. maybe adolescent level. Sure. And, um, but I, you know, started off on that and... Back then I like bootstrapped everything, you know, like I did read like a ton of free articles and did free trainings and all that kind of stuff. Um, And then as like my business grew, I did, was able to like start investing and taking Mm -hmm. marketing courses. And I think that has made a huge difference. And I live, like, we can't see my neighbors, right? Like they're they're there, but they're kind of like, I live in a valley that has a couple thousand people in it. And I, when I first got here, I would teach classes and have like three people in my classes, but that's not a sustainable living, right? Right. (laughs) And so then I moved that online uh, in order to make a living and um, I couldn't have done it without marketing courses. And I know like it can take a, I remember it in myself of just being like, it can be a hard thing to invest in yourself and like make that jump. And like marketing courses cost way more than herbal courses do. (laughs) So that's also a difficult thing to swallow sometimes, but it truly makes a difference. If you find, if you find the right course, that's like where you're at and has the right message um, and all that kind of thing, then that's going to pay off very quickly for you because there's just no point in like reinventing the wheel. And I, like, honestly, I see herbalists out there. I can tell whether or not they've done marketing because oftentimes they're making classic mistakes and just the mistakes we all make Mm -hmm. because we grew up in a semi, um, semi same culture, you know, so Mm -hmm. we're just like making these mistakes are just like classic. And then you like learn about, you know, you go to marketing class and you're like, here's the three things not to do. And that's pretty much what everyone does, you know, (laughs) left on their own devices. Sure. So there's just no point in like reinventing that, I think. The, the process of marketing really marketing is really like of like getting to know yourself yeah. better and learning how to express yourself better. Um, so it really can be a huge inward process, which can be hard too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And actually, this what we were originally going to talk about this, but you did have a you do have a course available. It's called Bloom, right? Yeah. Bloom Marketing for Herbalists. So we can leave a link for that in the show notes. Oh. So I'm going to do the cliche desert question. Oh, no. 
I, I have you to do, do it. You're going to do it. Yeah. Okay. If you could have. I'm preparing myself. If you could have one plant and one Tory album to take with you to a desert island, what would those be? I have to know. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I would take my wish and wish for a thousand wishes. Is that what your question was? Yes, yes. That's <laughs> cheating though. <laughs> okay. Um, well, oh, man, Mason. I know. It was impossible. It's impossible. You know what I often say? Yeah. I often call yarrow my desert island plant. Mm. Not because it's my most favorite plant, yeah. but as like a teaching tool because mm -hmm. it does so many things. Yarrow has so many gifts, yeah. often like first aid related and like acute injury and stuff. So I'm like, if it was a literal desert island, yeah. Yarrow would be the plant that could like save my life. Good answer. Um, so it can, you know, you could rub it on to keep yeah. the mosquitoes at bay yeah. and um, you can chew on it for a toothache. You can drink it for a sore throat. Yeah. Um I mean, promote digestion, um, relieve pain. So yarrow is like the literal desert island plant. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just it, right? Sure. We're just done now. Yeah. I can't talk about like roses or nettle or violets. Yeah. Or... You already chose your plant. But what about the Tori Amos album? And do you want to kind of like share with the audience, maybe say 60 seconds on your love of Tori Amos? 60 seconds? Yeah, maybe 120 seconds. Maybe I first seconds. heard Tori Amos in 1992 when yeah. I was 12 years old, and she became my favorite musical artist um, of all time. Yeah. And uh, I've spent a good portion of my life following her around, looking, um, seeing her tours and stuff. And in 2017, I went to Ireland, and I wanted to give her a copy of my first <laughs> book, which I had acknowledged her in because yeah. she is the soundtrack of my life. And we had a sh short conversation. I met with her, and we had a short conversation. Um in which she inspired my second book, Wild Remedies. Very cool. Yeah. And this year I'm looking forward to seeing her at Red Rocks and Seattle and yeah, so slightly obsessed. I mentioned I have an obsessive personality. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> we actually had to turn off Tori on the like in the speakers in the house for this interview. Right, right. I yeah, wanted to leave them on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube would not like that, but right on. Well, well I didn't answer oh, I shouldn't have called that out. I don't know. What's that? What what out Tori Amos album? Yeah, if you could maybe choose one, I would love to hear it. I'd love to hear your answer. You I feel like one. I'm like have a cold sweat right now. Yeah. Maybe you could cheat and say it's like one of those compilation like the greatest albums. hits. Yeah. I know, her albums are so good. You yeah, know, like a lot right. of people now have like singles, like right. her entire albums. They like they tell a story from yeah. start to finish. I'd go with Boys for Pele again, not because I could name a favorite, right. but there's it's just a powerful album. Boys for Pele. All right. Yeah. So you also have a podcast, which you've been uh, releasing episodes, what, for a couple years now? Yeah, a couple yeah. years now. So that's the Herbs with Rosalie podcast. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. I was on that show. You yeah, were I think on it, that <laughs> show. Yeah. That was super fun. Uh, I really love your format, too. You kind of, I want to say you get to know the herbalist, and then you always talk about one specific plant. Mm -hmm. And then the the guest always has some sort of recipe associated with it, which mm -hmm. I believe you provide like PDFs for mm -hmm. each episode. Mm -hmm. Super cool. And then uh, you always end it with like a, each season has a different question, mm -hmm. uh, which is always fun. Um, but yeah, great interviews, great guests. Anything else you want to say about the show? Not too long ago, I was yeah. at our local health food store and the cashier told me <laughs> that her favorite episode was the guy who talked about oats. That's right. Mason, That's she weird. said she listened to it twice. I, I, I can't believe that. Like just the saying of the favorite episode, but then saying they listened to it again, that... Oh man, that means a lot to me. So. You know, it's funny when I first told you that. Yeah. You were like, "Wow, and that's so cool." The cashier knew who you were. Yeah. <laughs> but later on today, we're about to go to town. You're yeah. going to see that that's not actually that impressive. Right. There's like a hundred people downtown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all know each other. Still though, that's that's pretty neat. Yeah, I was I was really stoked to hear that. That was fun. Yeah. Uh, so I shared a uh, um, a savory oatmeal recipe. Mm. I remember that. That was mm -hmm. that was a lot of fun to. Uh, and for that episode, uh, for 30 days, I don't know if you remember, I did a, a oat straw every day yes oat, milky oats and uh tincture oatmeal and then Ro robin rose bennett's uh oat straw meditation so anyways i don't remember what episode number what that that was but i'll leave a link to that in the show notes cool. as well um but yeah again alchemy of herbs uh wild remedies and herbs with uh, rosalie.com is your website mm -hmm. you could follow her on instagram at rosalie de la foray mm -hmm. um 
But TikTok. the best way to, to stay in touch is yeah. on my newsletter. That's right. I and you actually have a, every some Wednesday. sort of course giveaway for that too, don't yeah. you? Or yeah, an Herbal Energetics course. Herbal Energetics. And how do they sign up for the newsletter? Uh, if you go to herbswithrosalie.com, mm -hmm. then there's a sign up right there. Sweet. Easy peasy. Uh, we, we end all the shows on this last question. At least that's what we're doing for now. Uh, what's your big why that keeps you learning and growing as, as an herbalist? Hmm. Did I say that right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing that comes to mind is that that earth connection that we talked yeah. a lot about. Um, so it really does come back to that. But that not just from the like knowledge base, yeah. but that like sinking deeper into that um, connection. And I feel like that's something that doesn't just come from the books, but comes from being outside with the plants. Mm -hmm. And um, and I. I think I mentioned this already too, but one of my greatest pleasures is watching um, students in the Rooted Medicine Circle. We go through a journey together because it's a year-long course, and I watch people also make that journey of creating more awareness outside, creating moments of awe, yeah. and having that connection. And that really, like, you know, we had some couple, like, rough years, 2020, 2021. Yeah. yeah, rough years where a lot of people were really struggling. Um, I just... I, I like those were great years for me in that like we just started that program mm -hmm. and I was watching uh, these people go through that transformation and it gave me so much hope and so much joy like they lifted my spirits by just yeah. like being able um, to experience that with them and that also was just very um, yeah keeps me going keeps me inspired I love that yeah very good. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the Herbalist Hour, Rosalie. Thanks for fun. having me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming over. Yeah, this yeah, has been awesome. As Amanda and I have been enjoying our stay quite a bit. And uh, yeah, so thanks y'all for listening slash watching. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.